Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast here with John. John, it's a pleasure to be able to speak with you on my show. Can you please introduce yourself to everyone out there listening? Yeah, it's uh, I'm happy to be here, Robbie. My name is John Kellen. Um, I am the author of a book called Praise from a Future Generation. It deals uh, with the Kennedy assassination, a subject that I've been interested in uh, for a lot of years. Uh, the book was published in... Um, 2007. So it's been quite a while since it, it appeared. And frankly, I'm not into the case the way I once was, but it's one of those things that's kind of always with me. So um, it's like a lingering burn. Once you learn about it, you can't get rid of it. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Excuse me. Just a when it comes to the JFK assassination, where do you, every researcher, or every person I've talked to studies a specific area. Some people study the Zapruder films that some people study Harvey, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald's life. Some people study agents of um, people that might've been involved in the assassination plot. Where do you particularly focus? Uh, I, I think what you said is generally true. There are a few notable exceptions and there are several people uh, over the years who who really have had just encyclopedic knowledge of 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 the available evidence and can quote it chapter and verse they tend to be the exceptions um and you're right most people do tend to specialize um my own interest uh it, it it's kind of always been there um i got really interested after a period of of in uninterest lack of interest uh, uh after the uh, oliver stone movie came out which has been almost 30 years <laughs> hard to believe um uh, from my perspective um that sort of that, that sort of reignited my my interest um so i was reading very broadly about it throughout most of the 1990s and then I started going to uh, some of the conferences that they have. There's a JFK Lancer conference. So I think they're still going on. And there used to be an organization called COPA. They had the annual conferences, Coalition of uh, Political Coalition on Political Assassinations, I think is what that acronym stood for. Um, and uh, at one of them in 1998, I think I met a man named Vincent J. Salandria. He was one of the very first uh, Warren Commission critics um, back in the early 60s in the aftermath of the assassination itself, which, of course, occurred on November 22nd, 1963. Um, uh, Vince and I got to know each other, and uh, long story short, uh, a year or so later, he asked if I would be interested in uh, taking possession of his uh, of his papers, most of it, most of which was correspondence, but uh, also other materials as well. He said he's just, it was time for him to get rid of it. He was in his 70s by then. So I said yes. And uh, within a week or so of my agreeing to that, I got four or five boxes of big boxes of materials just on my front doorstep. And um, as I sorted it all out, says I'm a, I'm a writer to begin with. So I, I started sorting this material and collating it and, you know, a narrative sort of evolved in my head. And I started making notes that sort of evolved <laughs> into, um, into a, into a, into a narrative. And um, there was no actual moment where I said, I'm going to write a book about this stuff. But at some point I realized I, I was writing about these critics, uh, the correspondence that, that, that Vince had given me was um, mostly between him and other people who were actively researching the case in the uh, early to mid 60s, which was actually a very small number, only uh, 10 or 12 people. Um, I think I'm answering 
your question. Yeah, well, like I'm guessing a name probably was like David Lifton, a couple of the people that would say we on the other side are critics of the Warren Commission. Um, there's a form called 1095-360, which is um, in Randy Benson's film that you're in, um, where in the beginning it mentions this form of the Warren Commission gave out to every media outlet to blackball or blacklist every single um, person that writes a critic to the Warren Commission's official statement as a conspiracy theorist. And these are what people look at whenever you mention the JFK assassination, I always get one of two responses. The rare one is the one that goes, oh yeah, let's talk about it. And they want to talk about it. But then the others, um, the more common one is people roll their eyes. And it's because it's got lumped into this boat of conspiracy. And there is conspiracy conspiracy involved in it but the idea that the public has on it um is just so far from the original base of just manipulation from whatever you want to say you can say government whoever but that's what caused me to dive down and try and understand this more and i think that's with all every other critic or anybody that doesn't agree with the official story is once you start doing research into it you start realizing things aren't adding up by the official statement and you start finding weird outliers and these outliers are essential to the case uh, that's absolutely true. And uh, I absolutely agree with you that the case, unfortunately, does have a very bad public relations problem. Um, too often, uh, the, uh, shall we say, our opponents in this are likely to um, cast the question in really negative terms, frequently lumping it in with uh, UFOs and things like that, which is not to say anything against uh, UFO research, but um, it just snowballs from there. So absolutely, there is a there is a PR problem with with the case. Uh, the people that I wrote about uh, the name of the book, I think I said was is uh, praise from a future generation. Um, and the subjects of that book, these are first generation critics, as I call them, were people like Harold Weisberg, I'm just going to tick off a few names, Harold Weisberg, uh, Penn Jones, Jr., Vince Salandria, uh, who I mentioned before, Harold Feldman, Sylvia Marr, Maggie Field, Shirley Martin, Raymond Marcus, Mary Farrell, and Mark Lane. Um, these people came really from all walks of life, uh, from small business owners to housewives to attorneys and a former member of the New York State Assembly. This uh, book has uh, biographical sketches of each of the, the subjects, but the main focus is uh, tracing events from the time of the assassination, roughly through the uh, Jim Garrison uh, investigation. So, I have very little knowledge on who Jim Garrison is. I've only looked really through Malcolm Blunt's archives, but I've seen Jim Garrison's name mentioned multiple times on the FBI and CIA records that I've looked through. And they have his name next to it in parentheses, says weak link where there was like apparently even in the, I think in the JFK archives, they have documents that are labeled um, Garrison's uh, action that's going to defame uh, intelligence agency. Like they're, they're, they're listed as that, where I'm like, man, this doesn't sound like a very good article. You know, that kind of sounds like they're feeling threatened in a sense if they're writing it in those terms. Yeah, Jim Garrison uh, really was an important figure, um, no matter what you think about him. Um, he was the... Uh, the central figure in the Oliver Stone movie, uh, the JFK, which is essentially a retelling of, of the Garrison investigation. He was the uh, district attorney, the D, I think, in, uh, in New Orleans Parish, I think it was. I don't know exactly how all that all breaks down, but he was based in New Orleans. He was uh, the uh, DA there, and he came into evidence suggesting part of a plot may have been hatched and developed in New Orleans, which put it in his jurisdiction, and he launched his own investigation in, um, uh, well, he got serious about it in 66 or 7, I think, 1966 or 67, and it culminated in him formally charging uh, a local businessman named Clay Shaw, um, and then there was a trial that ended in Shaw's acquittal in 1969. So that basically is uh, how Garrison figures into it. Out of the list of researchers or critics, I would say of the Warren Commission that you listed off, I've, I know a couple. I know Mark Lane. 
Um, Mary Farrell, I've heard that people speculate that she was like some type of CIA mole or asset or something like that. And it just didn't make sense to me, but I know a lot of people, like people that agree with the Warren commission, even reference her site as a place to go to, to get information, like either if it's archived information, audio recordings or something like that, which through your work, or at least looking through all the researchers and writing about them, did you find any of them that you related to the most or in any of them that you felt attracted to the most? Well, in the first place, I, I would say that I think it's fair to say that um, no one is immune to that charge of, of, <laughs> of, of you know, surreptitious motives, un unknown motive. So, you know, I wouldn't want to even speculate on, on, on that. Um, Mary Farrell, uh, I think she died in uh, 2000 five or six thereabouts it's been a while uh it was before my book was finished um everyone on that list you named is no longer with us that's correct that's correct he's uh this is uh goes back a long a lot of years <laughs> this case and the, the first generation uh, critics are all gone uh, as far as i know david lifting is still around he he didn't figure in as a he was sort of a as far as my he was an important figure and remains an important figure as far as my project goes he was kind of peripheral he was there from the beginning but not as active as some of the others so um if uh, he happens to see this no, no I, I say this with all respect <laughs> david uh, <laughs> um i'm I, I think your work is important and and uh, and rightfully so um so uh yeah. <laughs> you got a list there which 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 one do you attract to the most which one did you find the one that you stuck with the most everyone's got a favorite you know our parents don't like to admit it but if we had siblings they had a favorite out of the bunch yeah i i don't know if i'd use the word favorite um um i got to know vincent slandria pretty well and as i mentioned he he gave me a lot of material that got me started on on what evolved into my book and so naturally i i i i have a lot of uh, appreciation for that um and some of the others uh i i well some of them died before i even got started on this um you know, I, I liked uh, Ray Marcus a lot. He was a very, very, uh, a really good guy. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I had a pretty good relationship with Shirley Martin to all of it over the phone. I mean, we never met in person, although I did meet Ray uh, in person. Um, um, did any did any of them seem like crazy conspiracy people like they always like hardly, to say not at all yeah not that, at all that's what not i get, at all that's what i don't get is like when people say conspiracy theory or that's crazy talk and then we have this idea of what we've heard it through the media but then you look into the research that they've done and it's like what are you talking about like this isn't crazy i mean there's some things i can't get with just because i haven't seen prior like i don't think they could bash in kennedy's head and pull out bullet fragments like that's best evidence for you but I, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I haven't talked to that person to be able to understand their perspective, but everyone seems like they have really a lot of weight behind the things that they've researched and looked into, which is what I respect about it. Because I mean, even with first generation research, you have a lot of ground to cover, but also you probably didn't really get the best information until my generation, maybe the generation before only because of how long it's been, the amount of documentation that's been released. I mean, 2021 files, they're still releasing. And then we still have some that are, you know, not, there now and it's just weird trying to get this like where i jumped into it i was like oh i got 50 years of work that's already been done ahead of me and then i hop into it i'm like wait a minute we're all still fighting at the starting gate like there's people that will disagree on this little statement or agree on this statement then they'll disagree on this and i'm like does anybody like realize that three people died that day and all three of them as far as i know had kids so like that should be our important goal that we should look into but everyone's got a different mindset when they head into it yeah, you mentioned best evidence. That's David Lifton's book, and and he does make a strong case for for uh, for his basic premise. Um, so that's that's important to remember. Uh, I would like to say that that you know this um, you're getting the, you're getting back to public relations and 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 the whole the whole issue having a, a bad name um, in in the mainstream media. Um, in my opinion. Uh, uh, the the question was there a conspiracy 
is 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 it's um it just doesn't interest me because it's beyond dispute i mean there was um and i want to talk about that a little bit because i think it's important to distinguish between conspiracy and culpability they're two very different things um as to the former there really is only one side to the matter uh it's obvious uh, that that there was a conspiracy and to debate the question really it really only perpetuates confusion and mystery and that that helps for lack of a better term that helps to the other side um now that said i understand of course there's always going to be people who are just getting interested in this uh, the subject and the events of Dealey Plaza, where the assassination took place, um, that's the natural place to begin. So uh, there, there, that said, though, uh, there was one of the critics uh, that I that I wrote about was a uh, man named Penn Jones Jr. He was uh, he lived in in a small town not too far from Dallas. And he said uh, long about 67 or 68 after he'd been you know, researching and writing about it for a, long, for a number of years, he said, how many times do we have to prove conspiracy? You know, we've proven it over and over again. Um, I'm fond of quoting Vince Salandria on this. He did an interview once and he said, Dealey Plaza reeked of conspiracy. Now by that, what he meant, the, the evidence demonstrating more than one gunman, that's what you mean by conspiracy. And that's how you separate it from culpability. Culpability is, is who arranged it, right? Um, so I want to talk about just, a, I've got a, I've, I've mentioned, I've written in some notes here, uh, of just a handful of the different points that as far as I'm concerned, it's really all you need to know to understand that there was a conspiracy and, and, and you know, that's, then you move on to culpability. Um, uh, so uh, I know for some some of your your viewers this is going to be old stuff. Uh, <laughs> I ask ask your indulgence. Uh, this is uh, most of what I'm about to describe. I think is kind of an assassination 101. I've got I think uh, five points that I want to make here. So I mentioned Vince Salandria. Uh, his brother-in-law was a writer named Harold Feldman, uh, and. Uh, with Vince's help, the two of them researched an article uh, called 51 Witnesses the Grassy Knoll, and it was published in a small magazine called The Minority of One in early 1965. Uh, it was even summarized around that time in uh, the New York Times. Um, so the article uh, concluded that uh, of the assassination witnesses in the, in the immediate vicinity um, who had an opinion, most said that they heard gunshots from the grassy knoll area, which is to say in front of the, uh, the limousine, the presidential limousine as it drove through the area, through Dealey Plaza on Elm Street. Uh, there were, I can't remember the exact number, it's 120 something witnesses, I think that were in the knoll area and the surrounding, uh, there's this little grassy island in the middle of the, of the area. There are 120 something people. A number of them did just had no opinion as the direction of the shots, but. 51 uh, had an, did have an opinion that the shots came from the direction of the grassy knoll, which is to say in front of uh, the uh, limousine. And the Warren Commission, of course, said that there was just one shooter and he was behind the limousine. Um, and a related point that it's not mentioned in the Feldman article, but this is definitely worth mentioning. Um, there was a Kennedy aide named Kenneth O'Donnell uh, and he was in the motorcade. He was not. He wasn't in the limousine with Kennedy, but he was in the in the motorcade. And he said that he also heard shots from the direction of the grassy knoll, the right from the right front. Um, but he didn't testify that way to the Warren Commission. He was called to testify, and and he did not say that. A few years later, though, uh, the former Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill, wrote uh, a uh, a memoir that I don't know what year it was published. Maybe early seventies. But O'Neill, Tip O'Neill quotes O'Donnell in that as saying that he did hear shots from the right front, but he also said, I testified the way they wanted me to. So that's that's a pretty revealing statement about the pressure that was brought to bear on at least one witness and probably most. Um, so that's one point. The majority of witnesses who had an opinion thought that the shots came from in front of the presidential 
the limousine. Well, back and to the left. It just, it, it, it's just, I remember when I first heard that and I go, well, then how, like you watch the Zapruder film and then it gets into the alteration of that. But I mean, we have Clint Hill that hopped on the back of the motorcade. He's in the film doing so. And he talks about seeing a, like an orange, I wouldn't say an orange size, but a circular hole in the back of Kennedy's lower part of his head. And that, that conflates with all the witnesses that saw a, like this back blowout and this blood that splattered and flew up into the air. Um, it just gets difficult. Like I said, when we talk about like conspiracy and then we talk about like what people would suggest as being fantasy, which in their minds, they link that with conspiracy is that we haven't seen any alterations like that. And usually when you talk about alterations like that, it leads into like the government. And it's like, if you don't know like about MK Ultra, if you don't know about a bunch of weird stuff that the government does and did and still probably might be doing, then you get into this area of like, I can't get with that. And they tune out. And it's just like, all right. Like I hear, I heard Vincent Solandria's last interview. He was in Max Good's documentary. I had Max Good on here talking about it. And that was Vincent's last interview. When you hear him talk, if you're not keen on what he's talking about, you're going to be like, this is one, this is a nut job. And he's not. He's just laying it out because he, he's at this level and he's t talking to you like the level you're supposed to, the level that he thinks everyone should know at. Like me and you talking about government corruption or something like that might be different than my conversation with David Lifton because we're at two different speeds. You got to know the prehistory to get to the level that Vincent Solandri is on. But he's when, he talk, when he's talking about a cabal of elites and it's a power system and a struggle to anybody that has never heard of that before, it's it sounds like conspiracy or crazy talk of what they label and it's really not it's a truth and it's a hard truth and that's what like I, I try and mention like trying to catch everyone up to like the same level it's like how do you take those steps how do you do that correctly you can do it in a film by showing documentation but even then we talk about the people that are just there to debunk or there to deny I don't know. I mean, it's it's hard to know that truth and then feel like the whole world you've been lied to in a sense as well, too. It's not that dark if you really get over it and you have time to grieve over it, but it's kind of like finding out Santa Claus isn't real. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you mentioned uh, uh, alteration of, of, you mentioned a couple things specifically, but there are, there's more than one area of evidence where there's talk, been talk about alteration. And as far as I'm concerned, that's the sort of thing that takes you down a rabbit hole and promotes confusion and mystery, which is counterproductive, I think. So that's why I'm trying to focus on just these, just enough pieces of hard, irrefutable evidence that is very persuasive that there were multiple gunmen in Dealey Plaza, hence a conspiracy. And that's all you need to know. Um, I am personally not interested in, uh, in the question of the Pruder film alteration, for example. I, I think that those who are interested would probably call me foolish and tell me that, well, once we show who faked the film, then, then ipso facto, we have the the conspirators or somebody connected directly to them most researchers are agnostic on it that i've talked to i mean it makes sense. right well that, that's uh, for me agnostic if i would call myself agnostic that would be a polite way of saying i don't care i'm not <laughs> interested because it 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 takes away from the even regardless of aside from that there's no way to look at the zapruder film as we as we have come to note it know it and not see that shots were fired from the front, that the body is clearly driven violently back and to the left, which just basic physics, that means a shot was fired from the front. Well, that's why we have the magic bullet theory because it can do anything you want whenever you want to do it. Sure, sure, sure. But, you know, believe your eyes, see the <laughs> film and, and, and understand what it says. So there's a, there's a, so that first point was that that most of the witnesses who had an opinion about the direction of the shots felt that it came from the grassy knoll area, which would, would have been in front of the presidential limousine. Um, there's an uh, an offsided witness named Lee Bowers. He was a, a railroad employee. It was a railroad tracks. You probably know this: the railroad tracks, a railroad overpass, and a big parking lot. In the uh, it was all is part of the, the Dealey Plaza environment. Um, and Lee Bowers uh, worked at the time for the railroad and 
he was in what they called a railroad tower um, behind the grassy knoll area. And there's a fence on top of the grassy knoll. And, and you always hear that, by the way. It's always referred to as a railroad tower. I've been there. I've seen it. I've taken pictures of it. It's like two stories. It, a tower, it sounds like it's going to be, you know. <laughs> 100 feet or 100 stories. Yeah, yeah, something like that. But it's not. It's, it's that said. But it does, it does provide a great, well, I haven't been actually in it. But you can, it seems pretty obvious that it, it does provide a commanding view of the area. It's just not what I would call a tower. Um, it's this funky little concrete building. They tried, okay? They tried. Well, it's always been called that. I, I don't know why. Uh, it, when I first saw it, it was like a lot smaller than I would have expected. <laughs> so anyway, that's beside the point. Um, in uh, in uh, police reports that were filed that day and uh, later on in his uh, warrant commission testimony, uh, Lee Bowers said that in the half an hour or so before the shooting, he saw three cars drive through the area in that parking lot area, all of it behind the fence right around him in, in this railroad tower. Um, uh, two of the cars had out of plate, uh, out of state plates. And each of these cars were incidentally were they were not together. They were five or 10 minutes apart. And um, one of them, uh, one of the cars, they, he appeared, the driver appeared to be speaking into a microphone. It looked like he had something up to his, in front of his face, uh, which I think su is suggestive of a radio coordinated uh, team of assassins. Um, he, Bowers did tell this to the Warren Commission. He, he also told it to Mark Lane in a filmed interview, uh, which is, uh, well, I wrote in my notes here, it's probably on YouTube, but it, just before we started this interview, I did, I thought I better check, you know, and I, I went to YouTube, I just typed in the search field there, Lee Bowers, that's all it took, Lee Bowers, and there was this about an eight minute clip of, of Bowers talking about what he saw, what I just described, these cars driving through. Um, so I would suggest to anyone who's interested, uh, who sees this, uh, you should probably check, check that out. It's quite, quite shocking. It's very interesting to see. Um, so another uh, another witness uh, was a, a, a Dallas cop named uh, Joe Marshall Smith. He was also in Dealey Plaza. He told the Warren Commission um, that right after the shots, <clears throat> he was approached by this hysterical woman who came up to him and said, they're shooting the president from the bushes. Which right there, it should tell you a lot. Um, um, So, and then the bushes, of course, would have been in front of, from, uh, <laughs> in front of the, of the limousine. So Smith was one of several other people, uh, also the cops, who uh, testified that around this time, they were approached by several men who were displaying fake Secret Service credentials. This is, uh, this is a matter of record. This is part of the Warren Commission's official record. Um, to me, that is suggestive of uh, being part of an assassination team. They're trying to control the scene and the immediate aftermath of the shooting and probably buy a little time for the assassins to, to make their getaway. Uh, according to the official record, incidentally, um, uh, every Secret Service uh, agent there that day was assigned to the limousine and went on to Parkland Hospital. None stayed behind in, uh, in Dealey Plaza. And then the last thing that I wanted to mention, the last point, uh, and that's the uh, Zapruder film. We were talking about this a moment ago. It shows the JFK, JFK's head and upper body slammed back and to the left. Uh, so whether you're in, you know, whether you are fond of arguing uh, for alteration or not, um, uh, this backward and to the left moment uh, movement is just unambiguous. There's there's no mistaking it. And it's, it's completely consistent with a shot fired from in front of him. When once again, uh, as we know, uh, the Warren Commission places a sole assassin officially behind uh, the limousine. So taken together, I, I think these are enough to uh, convince me of conspiracy. And I, I don't find any compelling reason to dwell on the events of Dealey Plaza 
um, beyond this, uh, then you have to move on to the question of culp culpability, and which is a whole rabbit hole of its own. But what do you mean you with me so far? Yeah, but what do you mean by culpability, though? Because I start to think because like Richard Bartholomew has the best example of like de defining conspiracy, which is people think fantasy when they think conspiracy, but conspiracy like conspiring to kill someone is real legal language. I mean, sure. The first well, conspiracy conspiracy just means two or more people acting together to commit a crime. So in in the in the the case of the of Kennedy assassination, it just means multiple gunmen. You know, officially there was Lee Harvey Oswald only one gunman stationed in the on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository, and he fired three shots after the limousine had turned a corner and was past him. So all of his, all the shots he allegedly fired would have would have been from behind. So when you have compelling evidence that shots were fired from the front. Um, that and at very least and and gunmen in more than one location, then you've got a conspiracy that answers the conspiracy question only two or more or more people acting together. What it doesn't tell you is who they were or and or why they were there and and acting on whose orders, if any ones, which of course they were. But so that's what culpability means. Legally we'll speaking. Because when you look at like the five points that you raise, that's like first generation. The old stuff is like the what the first generation could have. Because I mean, you're looking look at it from no research has been into the investigation at all. Today's day one of research. That means any person that's going to be one of these first generation researchers have the main the main meat and potatoes to tackle. And then what we have now at this point with everyone and all their independent research when it comes to the Z film alteration and all these, that's just because they've taken what people have already researched into and tried to break it down even farther and finding more bits and flags that they want to raise. So there's a wealth of information out there, but there's just so much that I think it's too much. I think it's that point where people get overwhelmed. I mean, when I hear yeah, yeah, the Rambler yeah. story and I see, I look through Roger Craig's testimony, the sheriff at the time, we talked about seeing a, uh, Oswald get into a Rambler and drive off. There's a couple other witnesses that saw the same thing. But then I start going, how do we know it was Oswald that was there? How do we know if he didn't leave or if he didn't, he wasn't on the steps at the time? And people go, well, I mean, he, we, there's video of him or there's people that said they saw him walking into the book depository building with a, a, a long gun. And I'm like, well, it was a long package. But everyone said it couldn't have been the rifle. And it, it, you, just, you just get these areas where it fits everybody's point, the C-tiers or the lone nutters. And this is where I stand. I don't agree with any of them. I don't, I'm not on anybody's side here. I just want to know the truth to set the historical record straight. And where I stand based on the evidence, there's definitely conspiracy involved in the fact that three people died. All of them had kids. Um, Oswald definitely didn't do it, at least from where I'm standing right now. I've seen some compelling evidence, I guess, to lean it that way, but also taking, uh, the research of the times back then the people that did testify or uh made statements that were witnesses at the book depository building they were african-american people and one of them had a dui from 10 years ago and he even talked about like he just agreed like he i didn't know oswald I was like you work with the guy what do you mean you don't know him like you start seeing like there's areas where you start wondering what's dallas politics like and you realize that a lot of those members and people have done research into this they were openly kkk they had ties to the to the gangs back there. You start realizing they're a little bit corrupt. So is it crazy to think that a testimony or a statement was forced, whether it was the Warren Commission that forced one or whether it was someone that was supposed to be doing their job of uh, investigating the death of the president might have coerced people into their statements? I mean, these, like I said, even saying that is conspiratorial, even though there's plenty of evidence to show that. Roger Feynman on, I think it was CBS or I think I'm getting that right, comes out with a statement where it was a message to the Warren Commission saying, don't worry, our media outlet's not going to go against the official statement from the Warren Commission. And he openly testified exposing that. That's an incriminating document. But then that's evidence to the conspiracy. But people need to see that and people need to know about that, but they don't. Usually it's just people shouting talking points. I mean, I've heard the lone nutters go insane with that one, but in the, in the case of Richard Bartholomew, though, you know, he saw this 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 rambler on the campus of uh, 
uh, University of Texas in Austin, I think. Um, and so, of course, he's got he's got to follow up on that. I mean, that's like, <laughs> and he makes a really compelling case for for that. And then the the guy that owned it, there who's at least whose name was on all the documents relating to the car, I think. Uh, uh, can't think of his name. Was it Bird? Was his name? Um, I can't think what his name was. But he um, he had quite a interesting background in in, in his own uh, on his own. Um, so yeah, you know, just because I, I say uh, you know talk, talked about getting a little over obsessed with the events of Dealey Plaza. That's don't don't misunderstand me. Um, because it this case really is all about specializing, and of course, uh, you're going to follow that which which interests you. In the case of Richard, there there's this car that he I, mean, I think he walked past it every day for I don't know how long, and was increasingly curious about it, and started looking into it, and one thing led to another, and and it was just it just it all kept connecting to larger larger things. Um, I just think there's a, there's a statement with Roger Craig, who is the person that saw the Rambler he makes in the interrogation of Oswald. And we know this from Hostie's notes where he mentioned to Oswald about this getaway vehicle and Oswald like abruptly stopped him and said, that's Mrs. Payne's uh, vehicle, leave her out of this. And it's like, that just, it, it's so conflicting because the way that the Oswald's relationship with Ruth Payne was seen as like they didn't like each other he wasn't allowed to stay there you know they she didn't want him there at all and it was like this now he's defending her and it's just like it, it's, it gets so confusing where it's like okay so what exactly is going on you have to take account for the time period the relationship that they have and it's just it's a wealth of information which i mean it just it it's, brings more curiosity to the conversation i think mm -hmm. yeah well ruth Payne uh is uh is uh one of those mysterious figures that that is uh involved in all this and um so yeah um i don't want to say anything about her though beyond that because i i i'm gonna remember something inc incorrectly <laughs> uh well you, you for me for instance i i started off with oswald i was like he's 24 years old that's my age um, he's getting blamed for allegedly killing the president. Um, that's a lot. And then he's killed 40 something hours later um, by a strip club owner, Jack Ruby. Mm -hmm. And so I had to dig into his personality, how to find out who he was. Um, I, I found myself more researching now about Jack Ruby just because, dude, they, in two weeks, they gave him 126 x-rays. I have the document to back it up. I'm just like, that's a lot of x-rays for one guy. Um, but that's the interesting stuff I'm interested in now, but with Oswald, I looked into his personality and it's a conflicting statements from everyone. I know people, his best friend that said he was a great guy. I know other people that said he was like a, a, a weirdo. Like if you asked him a question, he'd answer it. And I know some people that say he's mad with power. Um, but his mother always defended him. His, well, he, he, I don't know what you mean by mad with power. I mean, how much power does a 24 year old, year old warehouse employee have incidentally he only worked i think he was only there you said you mentioned some uh, uh like book depository weeks. employee who said who said like he didn't know who he was well i think it was only a couple of months so you know that's that's not surprising if someone might not have known exactly who he was that 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 was a a, a co-worker um well there was only like 15 people that worked there though 15 or 20 people that worked there Mm, I honestly don't know. That's, I mean, that sounds about right, or it could be. There's another compelling uh, topic uh, concerning Life magazine that I want to get to in a couple of minutes. Uh, first, though, um, you know, I'm, I'm really, I've really kind of moved away from all this, uh, this topic uh, in the last few years. Um, but inevitably, things kind of get my attention and there is something I've been I've been looking at recently that I, if that's okay with you, I'd like to describe. I think I mentioned it to you in an email. Um, it, it's this book called A Mother in History, and it was written by uh, uh, this woman named Jean Stafford, who was primarily a novelist, um, and it was published in uh, sixty six or sixty seven, I think. Um, 
So I've been drafting this, this short article about a mother in history in the last month or so. Um, and certain things are preventing me from finishing it at the moment, but I think things are going to fall into place before too much longer. Um, I, I read that book a long time ago, A Mother in History is what it's called. And it really, it really is, I think, um, an inconsequential book. It's not, it's not very important, except that it's dishonest. Um, and I think it was intended to, uh, to, to uh, discredit Marguerite Oswald, who was very vocal in defense of her son in the, in the immediate aftermath uh, of the uh, assassination. Um, even one of uh, Jean Stafford had several biographers and even one, one of those uh, called her book, A Mother in History, profoundly unsympathetic. Um, what has really caught my attention is a statement that Jean Stafford attributes to Marguerite Oswald in this book. Um, I wrote about it in my own book a number of years ago, but uh, just recently learned a little bit more. And so I'm following up on it in this article. If you tell me she lied in a book to make her book sell, I'll believe you. Um, I don't think that's why she did it, but it, there, I, I have uncovered something that, that strikes me as extremely dishonest. I'm, I'm not 100% positive I've got it right. Um, and I'll uh, tell you why. Uh, the statement that really caught my attention, and I quote it in my book, and again in this new article that I'm trying to finish up, said uh, the statement is, and I quote, he, meaning Lee Harvey Oswald, the statement, this is Marguerite speaking, he never did tell me why he went to Russia. I have my own opinion. He spoke Russian, he wrote Russian, and he read Russian. Why? Because my boy was being trained as an agent. That's why, end quote. Now, that's a pretty compelling statement, but there's absolutely no follow-up to it. You know, you think someone would, would say, Oh, tell me more, you know, and that's if, if someone said that to you in an interview, if I said that to you right now, you'd say, oh, really? <laughs> tell me more. I've seen statements of her saying that, though. I've seen multiple other researchers mention that as well, too. She oh, didn't. sure, sure. But this is this is a uh, this was in uh, remember, this is in 1966. So it wasn't a new idea then, but it wasn't uh, it was by no means mainstream. Um, what I learned is uh, just recently. Uh, a friend of mine told me that there are recordings that are uh, audio recordings related to this book in the Gene Stafford archive at the University of Colorado, which is pretty close to where I live. Um, so I went to the archive in early July, which is just about a month ago as we're speaking here today. Um, I've had to jump through a number of uh, bureaucratic hoops to get to these audio audio recordings. And so far, I haven't heard them, but I'm pretty confident that I, I will soon. Um, that said, while I was at the archive, I did come across uh, what appears to be a transcript of these recordings. It, it, it's not listed on the finding aid or the archives finding aid. And there's nothing on the document to indicate who made it or when they made it, but it, it looks like it's a transcript. Um, and it does seem to provide a source for the quote that I mentioned a moment ago. Um, but based on the transcript, it looks to me <laughs> like Jean Stafford basically manufactured the quote. Um, she doesn't let the reader know this because it appears as just a, as a single statement encased in quotation marks in print. Um, in the transcript though, that statement appears in bits and pieces over five or six pages. Um, so that she says part of the quote on one page and then two or three pages later, there's another couple of words from the quote and a few pages after that, the rest of the quote. Um, and, but there's no indication to the reader that, that this has been pieced together this way. So, I personally find that extremely dishonest and, un and unethical because she doesn't really say what Stafford says she said. 
Um, at this point, I don't know what to, the thing is, I don't know what to make of it because it's, it's such a compelling quote. And I, I, why would she do this? Why would Gene Stafford do this? Uh, and that quote again, um, he never did tell me why he went to Russia. I have my own opinion. He spoke Russian, he wrote Russian, and he read Russian. Why? Because my boy was being trained as an agent. That's why. Now, if you read that, doesn't it sound like she sort of took a breath and said that in one sentence or two however many sentences? <laughs> it sounded like it would be just something she would just say all in one go. It wouldn't be right. Right. She doesn't. Time. She doesn't. Based on this transcript. Now, it's entirely possible that once I get the audio, it's going to shed things in a different light and I'll have to spike my own article. That's that's possible. Um, which will be a, a bummer, but so it goes. Um, uh, but I, 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 I find it really dishonest. I, I'm, I'm, there's a similar, there's another example that I'm not going to get into um, that I delve into in the article. Also, that comes from this not an equally compelling remark that Marguerite appears to have said that based on the transcript, she didn't. It's really weird, and I, I, I'm. Well, do you think Oswald hated his mother? Because I, I probably have no, the I, more I, controversial I, There's nothing here to. In, I, 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 that's an area I wouldn't even want to get into. Um, I, how do you not want to get into that? If that's the most important thing, that would just make that statement even more true. How many? I'm 24 years old, and we talk about like 24 year olds. Everyone goes, Oswald hated his mother. I'm like, then how did she know so much? Because she knew a lot of stuff, whether it was him being in a radio factory in Minsk and a CIA agent giving him a debrief. I he there's I found articles in the 2021 release that show he was interviewed. A lady from a research review board actually suggested to the CIA saying, hey, what, what are your files on Oswald? There was a debrief from an agent named Demenslia and the agent that did the interview says that's that was a debrief but the cia never classified it as a debrief so then there's a four month gap in there and they go we do have a file on oswald apparently he did do an interview with us and they're like well why didn't you give us that when we asked for the debrief on oswald and they go we didn't classify that as a debrief so we didn't know what you were talking about well they watched his mail for four years and then they dropped the threat or the watch on him the week before he allegedly killed the president. So I go, now you have his mother making claims that her son's in the CIA. Where did she get that information from? Either it was given to her by some person that was interviewing them, or he called his mother. He wrote notes to her. And people say, well, he hated his mother. Dude, I'm 24 years old. And there are moments I hate my mom, too. I'm pretty sure we all have moments we hate our parents. But he's giving personal information, stuff about his mental well-being about his emotion like this this type of stuff that she knows and i go they might not have had the best relationship but they definitely talked so she pro he probably did an interview for the cia which i have documents to back that up but maybe he thought he was cia and he really wasn't or someone else was taking him as his protege and we know that from james angleton and other things but that's what i'm saying is like when you hear her talk about her son she has a lot of information about him that was either given to her or they had been talking before and every researchers i've talked to who said that oswald hated his mother even people that wrote books on him they, I, I just don't think they can remember what it was like to be like my age and that that relationship you're trying to break off from your family at that point and then if you have maybe uh, he did have a bad childhood i have no clue there's statements about that for sure but she knew a lot of stuff where I go, they had to talk at some points. I mean, I think there's even a statement from Marina Oswald. She was got a call from, um, I think she was there after he was killed. Right. They went in there and interviewed. They went, they walked through a little, uh, the jail or whatever it was. There's press, uh, footage of that. Yes. So, I mean, yeah. Well, talk. you know, uh, you've said a lot of things there, uh, Robbie. Um, I, I would say to anyone who says Oswald hated his mother, I would say what, the hell does that even mean you know don't don't present me with side some kind of sidewalk psychology and you know <laughs> and and try to make something out of it uh there's no there's no denying that marguerite oswald was an indefatigable defender of her son for the rest of her life i think she died in 1980 so she lived for another 15 16 years after the assassination and she never she was relentlessly as any parent would be um in in such a in in, in a case like that um, she was, uh, she never, you know, gave up on her son and with good reason. Um, 
my my point here is that I've isolated what looks like a manufactured, thoroughly dishonest quotation that is inexplicably attributed to Marguerite Oswald in this book, which again, it's called A Mother in History, and it really is inconsequential. It's it's a better off forgotten. So, you know, why am I even wasting my time on it? But I am. Um, uh, I think it's important that you that you you write about it and you're talking about it. Well, I mean, there there are true... there are there are much better books, and the the overall thrust it, it, and really what it does is it, it. I guess the 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 benefit of 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 showing this is a bogus statement is, you know how it is with liars. You know, and once you know someone's lying to you, then well, everything else they say is called into question. And you know, this is a this is a a dishonest book as far as I'm concerned. And yeah, if I could discredit it, even if it is a forgotten book, which I think it largely is, um, it, it deserves to be discredited because it's really, it's unpleasant reading. It's, it's, she makes her dislike, she, it's a, it's one of those unusual books where you can tell that the author seems to really dislike the person she's writing about. And uh, I think her whole point was to make Marguerite appear unstable. Because remember, the idea of, of, a, of a connection between Lee Harvey Oswald and any intelligence agency was pretty wild at that time. It, it wasn't a new idea, but it was, it was by no means mainstream. And I think Jean Stafford was trying her best to um, make Marguerite Oswald look mentally unstable. That was the overriding, uh, that was an overriding theme whenever she was talked about in the media at that time. So it, it's, uh, I'm not going to get into it now because it's a whole. Well, well, I just, arm, can't arm, <laughs> I just armchaired psychology, psychology to you a minute ago, I'll armchair psychology you again. It's just people that find a historical and it sucks because I like the historical record, but also people are trying to make a buck. Like I know so many people in the research community that have pretty good research. And then there's like a branch off point where then immediately every like sentence I'm hearing a name drop of the book. And it's just like, Oh, you don't like you might have added some details to make your book more interesting. To me, the interesting thing is just knowing the factual record. But people like those novels and stuff. Like I think, what is it? Me and me and me and Lee. I think was the book was called like about the lovers angle of loving Lee and all this. Uh, I mean, is that the Priscilla Johnson book? Uh, I think so. Or Priscilla and Lee, or Lee and uh, Marina and Lee, Marina and Lee. Yeah. Oh no, no, no. You're talking about the that other one. The um from about by van baker whoever yeah yeah uh i can't remember the name and people I'm, discredit I'm... people discredit her i have no clue i'm just saying people like the romantic novel of like this type of person in history i mean i get it i don't read those but i i like the historical record but i can see where it can get frustrating i mean if someone takes a real thing and then morphs it to make their thing fit that's a problem and that's what you know like that's why i say i was like do we have documents to back it up like I learned at this point talking to so many researchers is that if I'm going to mention something, I, I even that speculation I just did, I could send you the documents and the footage that I've gotten me to think that way. I just can't make any close calls anymore. I just can't say this is why I think this. I used to think um, there's a, a video of the motorcade before Kennedy's killed and he looks like he's waving and he looks at the camera and his face stops and it drops and it looks like. Well, how big is the camera back then? You got to think you're holding it up like this or something like that. Did he know he could he not see it from a distance? Could someone have been trying to hurt him? Maybe that's what he thought. And that's why his face drops. But then Rich uh, Bartholomew is like, no, he could have dropped his notepad or in his head thought he forgot his speech that he's about to give. You can't speculate like that. And I'm like, yeah, it's it's dangerous. And it's, it's OK to speculate like in conversation and stuff as well, too. But when you write a book about it and that becomes like the narrative, you don't know who's going to come across that book for the first time. And that's when it becomes like an issue. I came across like other, th like other work people have done. And then people are like, don't, that's not real. That never happened. And I'm just like, all right, so what is real? Like, I want to know what happened to JFK. I want to know all the events surrounding the time period. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, that, that kind of gets back to my earlier point where I, I think, um, I think part of the strategy uh, by that unnamed uh, uh, what uh, James W. Douglas calls the unspeakable uh, as a generic way of referring to uh, this malignant 
power that is out there. Um, uh, shit, no, I lost my, <laughs> I lost my, lost welcome, my train of thought. Welcome to Out of the Blank Podcast. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Well, but no, what, what I really appreciate about you is like not only the fact that you got out of the JFK thing and then you're still kind of dabbling in it a little bit but like that's the hardest thing for me right now is like how do i take a step back like i'm having fun just looking through documents that's i don't know a 24 year old that's looking through thousands of documents you know like it's just but it's interesting to me and it's like showing people that interest so whenever i see someone write a book about it i would just like like if they made sure like hey this is my interpretation rather than like saying like here's this book exposing this but I, I don't know. Is that, I guess that's how you get it to sell as well, too. Like, I've seen so many books on the JFK assassination. It's just, it's difficult because, like, is the one that I agree with the most the one that's right? Or is that a fantasy one as well, too? Uh, yeah. And what I was going to say, it, it sort of re railing that, uh, that train of thought was uh, the, um, what uh, James Douglas calls the unspeakable. I think part of the strategy in the aftermath of, of the assassination is the promotion of confusion and mystery so that you can never really know you know you can believe whatever you want to believe but it's it's really hard to know as absolute truth what happened uh you have to sort of develop a, a good uh, uh i think we can speak freely here uh, i think you have to develop a good bullshit detector um uh that's a big part of it because there's a lot of nonsense out there in my opinion and um, as far as my own book goes, uh, I can only call it uh, an honest effort. It, it, it didn't make, I lost money on it <laughs> and it's out of print. So I got no, I got no dog in the fight, uh, as they say. Well, if you write a book or a movie about the JFK assassination and you don't agree with the official narrative, you're going to lose money. It's just, they, they, uh, yeah, they, those well, most of the people, most of the people who have, who have, uh, you know, that I wrote about that that did uh, their own books. I mean, Harold Weisberg was a uh, is a good example. He self published his his own books. Eventually, some of them were picked up by by other publishers once it became a marketable subject in the in the mid '60s. But initially, he self published all his own things. So did Penn Jones Jr. Um, so did Ray Marcus. Um, so anyway, I I want to describe something that. That did I finish talking about that article? That uh, uh, let's see, I think I did uh, this article that I'm trying to finish up. Pretty sure you did. Yeah, uh, yeah. Just uh, but uh, I mentioned that uh, that that Marguerite, you know, the the quote that I mentioned that I've read a couple of times appears to be manufactured. But that's the strange thing about it. Marguerite did, in essence, say that. It's just that. Stafford cobbled together different sections that were separated by three and four pages and sort of manufactured this quote. And I don't get it. I don't understand why she would do that. That said, um, the, uh, the idea wasn't new that, that Lee Oswald had some kind of connection to, to an US intelligence and has been developed considerably since then. There's a couple of pretty good books on the subject um, that deal with it specifically. Um, none of them, none of them recent. There may, there's probably some that I don't know about, but there's a there's a book called Spy Saga by um, um, a guy named Philip Melanson, and Oswald and the CIA by John Newman. So those are anyone who might be one and interested in following up on that should probably check out those titles. Um, there's there's a there, there's a kind of a complicated issue that I, I wanted to mention because Life Magazine has a particularly bad place in the history of, of the assassination. I'm not a fan of Life Magazine either, so I think you're in good company. Do you, do you know what Life Magazine was? Uh, I had to ask a couple people because obviously I don't know what they were back then. Like it's like, um, yeah, it's long gone. It's, it's, it's been well, out of, out of print for people of... mentioned like Geraldo Rivera. And I was like, the Geraldo Rivera I know is different from the one that everyone else knows. Um, I know him from like a big mustache guy on CNN. And back then, apparently he was a big mustache. Well, he's guy on Fox was... now, I think Fox oh, news, oh, but terrific. <laughs> I, I don't know that he had anything to do with uh, with um, Life Magazine. Life Life Magazine was a very influential weekly, um, mostly a, known for its pictures. 
Um, they bought the Zapruder film. The, they bought the Zapruder film. Um, that's one of their one of their their areas of notoriety uh, insofar as this case goes. Um, and made a great serial while they did it. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> um, uh, they 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 did. Th this is going to be hard to visualize, but I want to describe it anyway because I've seen it myself. I've seen it physically, and I can vouch for it absolutely. And that is, have you heard of the three the three issues controversy? Yeah, about the multiple uh, three takes of the Zapruder film. No, um, it's well the Zapruder film figures into it. There were there were uh, there was the uh, couple of issues of in particular. There's more than a couple, but a couple of issues of Life magazine that are particularly um, um, they were particularly bad, uh, for this case. Um, it's not a good word for it. One was the October 2nd, 1964 edition of Life Magazine. Um, there were actually three versions of, of this issue, um, of the October 2nd, 1964 issue. That issue of Life heralded the arrival of the Warren Report. This was October 2nd, and Life was, or the Warren Report was the single volume Warren Report was published, I think, in September of 64. Um, so it had a big article about the arrival of the Warren Report. Um, and that issue of Life magazine went through at least two revisions. So there were a total of three. Um, and there's an article about this on uh, uh, Jim DiEugenio's uh, Kennedy, Kennedy's and King site, and it's called Life Magazine Warren Commission Issue, October 2nd, 1964. And you can probably do show notes. Maybe you can link to it. Um, uh, we can put a link to this when you publish this, uh, this podcast. Um, um, and I don't know whether there's... He's got illustrations, but anyway, Vince Salandri, uh, one of the, I've mentioned several times, uh, he noticed this back when the October 2nd issue was still current. Um, and he wrote about it that same year in uh, the, the Legal Intelligencer, which is a, a law journal in Philadelphia. Um, <clears throat> and he later wrote to a life editor asking about it. And uh, so this issue though, the, the controversy, to get to the point uh, with its different versions, it, it's difficult to visualize what I'm, what I'm about to describe. You really do need to see it to believe it, but I'm gonna take a, take a crack at it. Um, the critical part of this article about the Warren Report, it contains eight color frames from the Zapruder film, including the notorious uh, frame 313, which is the headshot. Uh, and each of these frames that Life published has a corresponding caption. So in the first version of the October 2nd, 1964 Life magazine, the caption for th frame 313, the headshot frame, says, and I quote, the assassin's shot struck the right rear portion of the president's skull, causing a massive wound and snapping his head to one side, the snapping of his head to one side. Uh, so it says he was shot from the rear, but his head snapped sideways. Uh, the frame itself is very graphic. It shows the exploding head, but no, no real head movement. Um, so that's the first version of the October 2nd, 1964 Life magazine. The second version, the caption is different. The caption has been changed to read. It's a little clipped the way that they wrote it, but that's what it's, this is a direct quote. The direction from which shots came was established by this picture taken at instant, bullet struck the rear of the president's head and passing through caused the front part of his skull to explode forward. Not sideways this time. This time it says forward. <laughs> uh, and it's a different Zapruder frame too, <clears throat> showing uh, Kennedy's body being moved backward and to the left, uh, supposedly by a shot from the rear. So that's the second version. The third version, the second revision, and but the third version um, of life puts the exploding forward caption with Zapruder frame 313. So this is hard to visualize. I know you really need to see it. Um, and I, I, I don't know exactly how to interpret it other than life completely misrepresenting what, what the film showed. Um, I used to have copies of each of these issues 
And really the only way to, to, to get the best sense of what's going on, you need to, I, I would lay them out on a big table, you know, and just see them all side by side and see the differences. And it's really quite, quite, <laughs> it's quite mystifying. Um, uh, that was not life's only sin. There's a, there's a better one. It's much easier to understand that I want to get to. I know we're running long here. We've been talking for a while. Um, <clears throat> but this is even earlier. This is in an article in the December 6th, 1963 issue, which is just a couple of weeks after the assassination. Once again, we're in Life magazine. Um, oh, I, I, left, I left something out. I left something out. I forgot. I'm sorry. Can we backtrack just a little bit? Yeah, I'm with you. Getting back to those three versions, uh, three three different versions of Life magazine in 1964. So Vince Salandria, this early critic, one of the people that I wrote about, he it, it took him a couple of years, but he eventually he wrote to uh, an editor named Ed Kern at, at Life magazine. And I've got a copy of Kern's reply right here. It's, it's like two and a half pages long. Kern addresses... Vince's uh, questions in the first paragraph, and then the rest of it, he just talks about something else. The rest of the letter just talks about something else. So this is what Kern wrote to him. Dear Mr. Salandria, I am at a loss to explain the discrepancies between the three versions of life which you cite. I've heard of breaking a plate to correct an error. I've never heard of doing it twice for a single issue, much less a single story. Nobody here seems to remember who worked on the early Kennedy story. It was one of those team efforts with several researchers and the re researchers who worked on it have either left or been shifted to jobs in bureaus or overseas. I was not involved in the Warner Report story at all until just recently. So it's like a non-answer. He mm -hmm. just kind of <laughs> brushes it aside. There's not a lot surprisingly. of that. There's a lot of that. Yeah, yeah. But again, this this is it's so it's it's, it's an un, almost unprecedented what what happened with these three issues and, and he just uses the term breaking plates, which was, I guess, sixties technology for for publishing magazines, um, in that that pre computer era. Um, <clears throat> but uh, he so he acknowledges that this happened, but it it sounds virtually unprecedented. So, but there's no answer other than life was trying to get their story straight. This other matter, this other matter with life, is, um, if you'll indulge me, it's a little easier to understand. And it's, uh, it's from the December 6th, 1963 issue, which is just about two weeks after the assassination, so very fresh. Um, and life had an article called End to Nagging Rumors, the Six Critical Seconds. And there was a paragraph in that article that completely misrepresents what the Zapruder film shows. And remember, Life had just bought all the rights to the film. They, they were not, uh, I think they, they may have published some frames, but they were really small and fuzzy and, and they didn't really tell you, show, show you very much. Um, so this, this is a matter about the throat wound. And the article says that because Oswald was behind the presidential limousine, quote, it has been hard to understand how the bullet could enter the front of his throat. Hence the recurring guess that there was a second sniper somewhere. But the eight millimeter film, the Sapruder film, the eight millimeter film shows the president turning his body around to the right as he waves to someone in the crowd. His throat is exposed toward the, toward the sniper's nest just before he clutches it. So the Sapruder film, of course, shows no such thing. <laughs> But Life, uh, Life published this uh, at a time when few outside of Life magazine and the government uh, had seen the film and, and, really, and knew what it really showed. Um, and I would suggest to your viewers, anybody who has not, I'm, I'm sure, Robbie, that you've seen the Zapruder film by now, but anybody who hasn't, uh, I would suggest uh, searching, searching for it on YouTube or elsewhere on the internet. And if you haven't seen it yet, uh, be forewarned, it's very graphic, even after... Uh, even after 60 years, almost 60 years, it's it's pretty I stunning like, to uh, see it. I like Gilbert Jesus's take um, about the throat shot where he talks about when Kennedy gets hit. It looks like he's trying to cough something up because he's got his one hand over here. It looks like he's grabbing at his throat, but he's got his chin tucked in like he's trying to cough something up. And it just made me like whether it's obviously it's like a, a, a weird thing to speculate about. But it, it's just something in my head where I'm like, imagine you just get hit so quick with something. 
that it hits you right in the throat where it feels like something just right. Like I've been hit by a BB in the throat before, you know, a metal BB it doesn't, didn't go in, but it's just like, it's something you like, it, it take it, it's so instant where I go, imagine getting hit in there and something actually gets lodged in your throat. Cause apparently it only went into the tip of the finger. It looked like you're trying to cough something up. I just thought that was an interesting, you know, perspective of things. I think like someone's going to find something that they find about the case that they're going to latch onto, whether it's the Zapruder film, whether it's Kennedy. I was attached to Jackie's dress. Why do they wait till 2100 to release that from the archives? That's weird to me. But whatever gets someone interested into the topic to be able to talk about it, I'm all in for. I just wish we'd, there'd be a little bit more conversation about it, which is why I've been doing my show and speaking to both sides of it. Um, Cause you don't see that really anywhere. I mean, not, I'm not saying my show is an exception. I just mean in the education forums, the things that are designed to be talking about these debates and these assassination things, it's like immediately the thread that I post, I could post something, the thread gets hijacked to someone just bragging about a book or a film or whatever. I'm like, that's great. But we got to talk about like things like, um, I actually got some criticism recently because I put up an article about Bugulosi, um, who wrote a book called Reclaiming History. Tom yeah, O'Neill yeah. wrote a book. I, I, about I wrote him. a review about it. That book. It was Tom wrote, Tom O'Neill wrote a book about him and Tom O'Neill wrote about the Manson murders. And he also got freedom of information act information on Bugalosi. And I can send you this story as well, too. I have it. I posted it in the forum, but it was about the, his love child came out. Apparently this, he had a lawsuit with a milkman over $300. Well, it went a little bit deeper than that. It was $15,000 to keep quiet because he was harassing this family and also was harassing at the time, a girl that he had impregnated while he was having an, it was basically an affair with his wife. She didn't want to have an abortion because she was Catholic. He went to her house with his secretary after calling the doctor that she was supposed to go get because she agreed to getting one um, because he just kept trying to convince her, called the doctor who broke a HIPAA violation, told her that I've never seen this person before. He went to her house, sat there with his secretary to type up her uh, statement that, yeah, you know, I agree to this and I agree to that and be paid to keep quiet. Um, she called the cops. The cops heard Vince there. And they wouldn't leave until he came out and then he was arrested. And that didn't come out until after he died. And everyone gives Tom O'Neill criticism about that. I posted that article in the forum and someone comments just like a C tier to make fun of uh, deflame a person's character or whatever. Um, and I go, you've done that with Oswald. You've done that this whole entire time on the lone nutter side. So I go, I'll do you one better. I post an article about Mark Lane. Mark Lane was involved in Jonestown. He was there. I didn't know this is I'm scrolling through FBI documents and CIA documents and I'm coming across this. There's well, Lane wrote a, he wrote a book about it. So that's, it's not a secret. I he mean, was he there. Just, oh, I know. I know. Yeah. I heard him talk about it. So I, I'm just saying I like, so I'm not just throwing shade at one side. I'm, I'm coming across the documents and I'm not here picking sides here. I'm just saying, this is what I came across and this is what this is. And someone can decipher it however they want, but I'm looking strictly from what has been published, the documents I have evidence to promote. If you don't like information, whether it's on your side or another side, the issue is that we think of this as sides. I get you have official statement from the Warren Commission, you have people that believe there's a conspiracy, but Overall, I mean, if it just comes to having a healthy conversation about things, it's it, it's got lost. And that's where I see why we're in the same predicament we've been in for so long is that we're just fighting each other at this point. It's the best divisive strategy. If you're a government trying to cover up conspiracy, the people start the people that are supposed to be investigating it, start fighting amongst themselves. Oh, sure. Divide and conquer is the oldest strategy. We're, we're in the midst of a massive uh, <laughs> version of it right now in American politics. You know, as, as far as Vincent Bugliosi goes, um, I don't know anything about his personal life, and I don't really care. I'm not. It sounds like what you describe is pretty reprehensible. But more to the point, is that his book is is uh, his book about the case was dishonest, and uh, I, you know, it, it it. I'll send you a link to this review that I wrote about it. I, I there were some things in it that were just pretty, pretty. I can send you the story if you want. It's a long yeah, read. Yeah, I'd though. like to see it. I'd it's like a, to see it. It's a very long read. Jonestown's, I had, because I reached out to guests to do uh, who were involved in Jonestown to be on the show. And they kept asking me weird ass questions. Like, do you, what's the, if, like, you understand, like, everything that you know is wrong. And I'm like, what? And it's like family members who lost people there. 
yeah, it was one crazy guy, but also I was looking through the FBI files and I could send you all, it, it's going to be a lot of links, but they have different parts on Jonestown. And there's even talks about in there about they infiltrated Jonestown. And I'm like, wait a minute. So is this like the same thing with the JFK thing where people hear the official story and then it might be wrong. It might be more conspiracy involved. Like did we have hands in this as well too? And it's like, I just, that's what I want people to do is just to think more about stuff. It doesn't mean you need to sit there and be like, that's not real. That's not real. But just, I mean, you read into it to me, it's fascinating as hell. I mean, I found out Walt Disney was an FBI informant. I had no clue, but there's documents to back it up. Well, you know, there, there used to be uh, in the sixties and seventies, there was this comedy troupe called the fire sign theater. I think they were called. And I don't know much about them, but they had, a, they had this, some album out of this is, comedy remember but the title of the album was everything you know is wrong so i know i think that is a take that as a basic starting point for a lot of it's a cherry on the sunday is what it is a cherry on the sunday i'm going to send you those um documents but john can you please promote your links where people can find your website um and anything else you want to promote as well too sure by that you mean i i don't have much i mean i'm really not active in this at all i i had a i had a well, I mean, site, just, one your or two site, sites. just your site that you write about anything. It doesn't have to be, just be JFK related. Sure. Okay. Um, y you mean uh, something to put it like in show notes, like links yeah. for people? Well, to, where can people sure, find send you? It. Okay. No, you, well, get to, you get well, to say it off here so then people can hear it in their car and look it up. They can, they can, if they sneak into my backyard, they can like find me <laughs> down in the basement <laughs> practicing my guitar. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not really active in any of this. I, I, I haven't been writing much lately. I, I, I mentioned this article that I'm drafting uh, that I hope to finish soon. Um, the uh, people at this Gene Stafford archive told me that they've had some kind of a staff shortage. They're shorthanded, and that's what's taken them so long to get me copies of this this recordings. But once I get that, I'll finish this article. I, I did describe it. Uh, in general terms to uh, Jim D. Genio, and he, he expressed an interest in it. So maybe it'll show up there in the near future. Um, and that's that's the article about Gene Stafford and a mother in history. Uh, if, if worst case scenario, I'll put it on my, I do have a, I do have a blog related to my book. I don't put much about it. You know, I didn't mention Hood College at all. I, I know you're probably running way long, but- Yeah, we got to go in a second. Okay. Uh, th there's, a, there's a growing archive in, um, in um, Frederick, Maryland at Hood College that that I think more people should be aware of. Um, they've got the papers of Harold Weisberg and Sylvia Marr and Ray Marcus. And I just gave them all my stuff last uh, April. Um, none of it is widely available yet, but uh, it, it has the promise of in, in, the, in the not too distant future of being a real gold mine for anyone who's interested in um, in this, this subject and wants to locate documents and, and raw material and and primary sources so. send me the details i will look it up because i'm definitely interested in everything about this thing um john it's been a pleasure chatting with you i'm going to link all your links even the website where you write articles as well too even if it's not jfk related i'm going to put that in there it's been a pleasure chatting and thanks for listening to this episode of out of the blank